Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Essential Guide to MIDI in Cubase. In the last episode, we had a look at notes, which is far and away the most important thing if you're dealing with MIDI. But there is a load of other stuff to look at, and I'll try to demystify some of that for you today. If you're enjoying this series, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. Awesome way to help support me. Now, as you can see in Sonic, I've loaded a new sound into the engine. This is, again, completely standard SE preset, so you should have access to this. I'll be using this deep meditation sound today and diving into a few of the extra features inside Sonic to show you some of the different MIDI messages available to us. Before we get on to some of the formal definitions, and I'll end up showing you a tree of how the MIDI protocol actually looks, I'm going to introduce the second type of MIDI message, which is pitch bend. And I'm sure everybody's witnessed pitch bends. The vast majority of keyboards have a pitch bend wheel. But pitch bend is actually a bit of an outlier in the MIDI world. There are a few things about it that are a little bit weird. So we want to deal with it specifically. What I've done here is I've set up a part with a couple of MIDI notes, as you can see. I'm just going to press record and I'm going to record some pitch bend data uh, using the pitch bend wheel. That'll do us. Now, even though you can't see what I've just done, there is MIDI pitch bend data in this part. In fact, you can see it visually in this kind of highlighted section, but we want to actually be able to see the data. And we can do that in the editor below. Down in the bottom left hand corner, you've got this create controller lane. And if you press the little plus symbol, this little diamond here tells you that there is MIDI data of this type in this part. And if you select pitch bend, then Cubase will create a new controller lane for you. I've just zoomed in nice and tight so that we can see exactly what's going on here. And I'm just going to select one of these MIDI events right at the very top where it's basically flatlined. Have a look at that number, 8,191. This is one of the weird things about pitch bend. It's capable of going past the normal 127 limit. Typically MIDI messages are stored in byte size chunks, which means you've got 256 numbers to play with, two to the power of eight. And the way that that manifests is plus and minus 127, which is 254 different numbers. Then we've got zero, and then we've got a positive and negative sign to cap it off. So that's how a number is stored in 256 um, bits. That's why your MIDI values always max out at 127, but it's different for pitch bend because pitch bend has 14 bits to play with, which gives it a positive and negative maximum, as you can see, of 8,191. But pitch bend is actually pretty special in its own right. It does contain its own slot in the MIDI protocol, its very own reserved space that nothing else can fill. And there are other types of MIDI message that also have their own slot in the protocol. Now I'll just bring this um, JPEG onto screen very briefly and then throw it away again. I'll embed it during editing so that I can basically talk over the top of it without Cubase keeping on hiding it. So at the top you can see note on and note off we've already dealt with. Again, they have reserved dedicated spaces in the MIDI, MIDI protocol just for them. And you can see that as part of the note on message, that's where the velocity is stored. We also discussed in the last episode how there's no concept of length. Even though we see notes as having a start and an end and a length, they don't inside the MIDI protocol. Here's your note on, here's your note off. That's all there is, there's nothing in between. Down at the bottom of the list, you can see pitch bend. Here it is with its own dedicated slot in the protocol. Let's deal with another one. Let's deal with channel pressure next. And as you can see, this is more commonly called aftertouch. And in fact, in Cubase, it's called exactly aftertouch. As far as the MIDI protocol is concerned, this is called channel pressure. Now, in order to record aftertouch, you need a keyboard capable of generating aftertouch. There's kind of a spongy paddy bit inside um, most keyboards these days. Once you've hit your, your maximum velocity level, you can go into this extra kind of spongy bit. That's your aftertouch. I'm going to record some aftertouch now. Now what I did to record that data there was to physically press a key on the keyboard and then press deeper into the key and you can see me pressing into the key down to its maximum extent and then releasing it again. And I did that three times and we've got these little hills. But you're not hearing any change of sound from the VST as a result of this 
because it's not currently mapped to respond to aftertouch. And that's why I've chosen this deep meditation sound. It's based on the Flux engine inside Halion. Halion is a bit of a weird thing. It's kind of an overarching umbrella term within which there are many different mini synths and one of them is called Flux. And the nice thing about Flux is that we have a thing called a modulation matrix. I'm not gonna get into the in-depth details of how Halion works today, but I am gonna plug a couple of values into the modulation matrix down at this slot number six, which is empty. I'm gonna tie it to aftertouch. And I'm gonna say, when we receive an aftertouch message, we're going to vary the filter cutoff. Finally, I just need to dial in an amount, a modulation amount. So I'll dial the default cutoff back. So it's quite a dull sound. That's the effect we're gonna get with these little aftertouch bumps. Let's have a listen to that. Okay, so that's three different kinds of MIDI messages that we've now been introduced to. Notes, which are note-ons and note-offs really, pitch bend and aftertouch. Let's have a look at another type of channel message. This time we're gonna deal with control change, otherwise known as continuous controller. So when somebody says MIDI CC to you, they either mean continuous controller or control change. They're basically synonymous. And again, I'm gonna use Halion to help me and I'm gonna use the modulation wheel as well. Now by default, the modulation wheel outputs CC number one data. And we can use that by plugging in the modulation wheel. This time I'm gonna dial in some distortion and we'll have plenty of that. And so here's my modulation wheel. You can see it going up and down on the Halion interface. And I'll get some recorded in. Again, we need to make the lane visible. And you can now see that there's CC1 data that's just been recorded in the part. And here it is. So you can see me increasing the wheel and decreasing the wheel. And this is where it's really easy to get confused as to what CC data is, but it's not complicated. There are 127 dedicated slots ranging from CC1 up to CC127, each of which is capable of containing a different type of message. Now, some of them are by convention reserved, and the modulation wheel is a good example. It almost always appears on CC1. And so out of the box, if you plug your brand new keyboard into your computer, I can pretty much assure you that it's gonna be outputting CC1 data via the modulation wheel. It's a convention. Some of the numbers are reserved, and you can see that um, mode messages, which travel on CC numbers 121 to 127, really shouldn't be used by you because they're dedicated, uh, they're dedicated for mode messages. And this is stuff like if you press the emergency reset button to shut all MIDI notes down, that's one of the notes in that range. We can get a better idea of what some of those standards are by having a look in the configuration of the MIDI page itself. If we press this little drop down button, controller lane setup, and we head into setup available controllers, as I scroll down this list, you can see the conventions in the in parentheses. These are the conventional values for all of the various um, MIDI CC values. And you can also see that we've got the standard, the most common ones set up in the visible menu. If I want CC62 to be permanently visible, I can add it to this list and there it is, CC62. Now when I come out and press my little plus button, it's going to appear as a permanently selectable value over here, but it's really just 127 slots capable of, cap capable of taking a MIDI message of a particular type. Now, every MIDI control on your keyboard or hardware device, whether it's a knob or a slider or a button, is going to be capable of generating a MIDI message. If we have a quick look at the MIDI monitor, and I'll just clear it down. And I'm gonna turn uh, a knob that's assigned to CC22 on my keyboard. And there you can see that CC22 data being output. All I'm doing there is turning the knob backwards and forwards, and it's sending out this absolute mass of MIDI data to Cubase. So it's capable, Cubase is now capable of recording that. If I press record once more, and turn that knob backwards and forwards. Not making any difference to the synth sound at the moment, because I've not mapped anything to CC22, but it is there. 
There is a limit to the number of lanes that you can have here, but it's easily big enough to be usable. Okay, here's CC22, and there's me moving the knob backwards and forwards, but it's not being configured to anything yet. I can go into my Halley and Sonic SE instance now. I can map any control in the synthesizer to understand or receive MIDI data of that type. So if I right click and say learn CC on the filter knob, that filter knob has now been assigned to CC22. In this particular case, it'll now respond to both of these cases because the aftertouch is also outputting filter information. So let's see the filter knob go up and down as I press play and we read all of these CC22 values back in. And there you could just see the, the filter knob stutter a little bit as it was competing with the aftertouch commands which are also mapped to the same function. The two standard MIDI channel messages that I'm not going to talk about today are poly key pressure and program change because I don't use them. Uh, poly key pressure is basically like aftertouch on a per key basis. You need a keyboard capable of outputting it, but you could basically play a chord and have each one of those notes generate its own aftertouch values. Aftertouch itself is a channel wide message, that's why it's called channel pressure. The other one, program change, is really for synthesizers that are sound generators in their own right. You can send program change information to that synthesizer to say, switch to the piano or switch to the drum sound or organ or whatever. Right up at the top of the hierarchy on the other side of that fence, we've got all of these system messages. Again, this is something that you very rarely interact with. And in fact, I don't at all anymore. I used to store system exclusive message data in my projects. So I would take dumps out of my like Boss GT, whatever it was, five at the time, press dump on the, on the box, press record in Cubase, and you can actually store all of your internal Boss sound effects sounds inside your project as binary data. You can then press play in Cubase, read on your hardware device, and it will basically send all of that information back to the device so that you can recall those sounds for that project. It's more trouble than it's worth, I found, so I stopped doing it. But if you want to use those kinds of messages, then you would need to go into your MIDI filter and make sure that system exclusive messages aren't filtered because they are in my system. So Cubase doesn't even record system exclusive information on my system because I've told it not to. If you're finding the project is being overwhelmed by particular types of message, let's say you're not interested in recording aftertouch at all, but every time you press a key, key on your keyboard, you're inadvertently recording aftertouch. Well, you can simply filter it out using these values here. And now Cubase won't record that type of MIDI data anymore. In terms of the manipulation of the data in our project view, there's a few nice options available to us. At the moment, I'm able to draw pretty much freeform. I've got snap turned off and I can draw any type of channel message that I want. If I head down into this little drop down menu and type type of new control, if I change that to ramp, now when I click individual events in the controller, as you can see, it now gradiates smoothly between them. In fact, we have very flexible control over this MIDI information. Basically what Cubase is doing behind the scenes is translating this into discrete values. The MIDI protocol is 0 to 127, end of chat. If you can see something different to that in Cubase, then Cubase is having to do an internal translation to turn each one of these values into a, a relative MIDI value of the same amount. Ultimately, it's got to send something between uh, 0 to 127 on an integer basis to the outgoing device. But this is a really nice, smooth way to draw these various gradients. If you want to get rid of everything that you've been playing with, you can say select the velocity lane, show the velocity lane only, it throws everything away. And then we can also say show used controllers, and then you'll just see the lanes that have data on them. Pitch Bend has a couple of extra features. I'll just make that one a little bit bigger to demo some of this stuff. So we have a grid that we can enable. If we say show the semitone grid, then Cubase divides the available space into this Pitch Bend range. So as I make the range bigger, you can see that it's now spanning over quantized pitch ranges. If I then engage snap pitch bend events and draw some values in, you can see it doing exactly that. 
Finally, if you have a very large amount of MIDI data, like when I was turning the knob on the keyboard, all of this CC22 data is quite intense. Some of these messages are actually the same value output multiple times. You can see horizontal lines. If you head into the MIDI menu, functions, thin out data, it'll edit out all of the MIDI values that are identical to the previous sent MIDI value. And there you can see all of those identical values have now gone. That'll do us for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks a lot.